I've had the 12.9 inch M1 iPad Pro for over the past six months now, and in this video, I'm going to walk you through the features on this iPad that I've used the most, the downsides that come with using it, and who I ultimately recommend should get an iPad Pro. First up, the display. The 12.9 inch version of the M1 iPad Pro houses Apple's best display technology to date. It not only has a 120 Hz ProMotion display like the iPhone 13 Pro and new MacBook Pros, but it also features Apple's mini LED display technology. After six months, to me, the display is the top feature of this iPad Pro. Now, I originally thought that this was going to be a downside with the iPad Pro because mini LED displays, this one included, often have issues with blooming. And you can get this display to bloom. But like a lot of issues that typically arise in news headlines anytime a new Apple product comes out, Usually it's overblown, and after six months of use, for me at least, the blooming on the iPad Pro display has been a non-issue for what I've used my iPad Pro for. And the increased contrast ratio of this display far outweighs the negative effects of display blooming. And the 120 Hz display just makes everything on this iPad feel wicked fast and smooth. It's one of those features where once you get it on one of your devices, you want it on all of your devices. The next feature that has made a huge difference for me on this iPad Pro is Face ID. And while this isn't a new iPad Pro feature, the iPad Pro is currently the only iPad in Apple's lineup to feature Face ID. And weirdly, the only Apple device made for typing that houses Face ID since this year's MacBook Pro oddly did not include Face ID with the new redesign. To me, after having six months to use my iPad Air and my iPad Mini, which have Touch ID embedded in their sleep-wake buttons, and comparing that experience with the Face ID experience on the iPad Pro, there's just no getting around it. To me, Face ID is the fastest way to authenticate into an iPad, and it's just more convenient. The only issue I've had with Face ID is when I have my iPad on a table and I'm standing up more over it, it doesn't really work well in that situation or if you're too far away from it in that situation either. But in all other scenarios, it's been great. The next feature I've really liked with the 12.9 inch iPad Pro is the full size Magic Keyboard you can pair with it. I prefer typing on the larger size of the Magic Keyboard because you get a little bit more space for your fingers and it feels exactly like Apple's laptop keyboards. The key travel is great and having an integrated trackpad is very useful thanks to the cursor support in iPadOS 15. Without the Magic Keyboard, I'd be using this iPad way less. It basically turns your iPad into a laptop configuration which is great for writing and web browsing. Also, the new white color of the Magic Keyboard has surprisingly held up really well over the past six months, and it looks better than the black version did at the six month mark in my experience. Though I have been pretty careful with it since the white color of the Magic Keyboard is susceptible to color transfer. Now, the next thing that's made a really big impact on my use of the iPad Pro are all of the Apple ecosystem benefits you get when you use other Apple devices with the iPad Pro. The ones I've used the most with this device are Apple's automatic headphone switching with AirPods and certain Beats headphones, continuity with my iPhone where I can pick up where I left off on an app on my iPhone on the iPad Pro, AirDrop which makes it easy to move files wirelessly between all of your Apple devices, and spatial audio support for paired AirPods devices which makes it sound like you're listening to something in surround sound, and that paired with the HDR capabilities of this iPad Pro's mini LED display make it a a fantastic content consumption device. iPadOS also got some new features that have made a big impact on how I use the iPad Pro. First, the app library finally came to iPadOS, so now you don't have to scroll through multiple pages in order to tap an app and open it. You can just have your home screen and then the app library to get to certain apps, and this feature has worked quite well for me. Another new feature that debuted in iPadOS 15 that I've been using a lot is called Hide My Email, which allows you to use an auto-generated email address to give a company when you sign up for a service or you're trying to get a discount on a product and need to sign up for a newsletter. Apple will forward emails sent to the auto-generated email address to your actual email address so merchants and others don't actually receive your real email address. And it's really easy to go into iCloud settings to delete one of these auto-generated email addresses if you no longer want to be on an email list from a merchant or a specific person. 
Some other notable things I've liked about the iPad include the improved selfie camera, their performance where everything I've used on this iPad for me has performed exceptionally well and I haven't run into any performance lags. And I also like having that Apple Pencil second generation support, though I don't use it on this iPad as much to take notes on as with my iPad Air or my iPad Mini, since those are a bit easier to carry around and write on. However, I could totally see where having the extra screen real estate of the 12.9 inch iPad Pro would be beneficial to those wanting to do artist and graphic design work. I mainly use the Apple Pencil for note taking and signing documents. And speaking of signing documents, I actually stumbled across this really cool feature that you can use between a Mac and an iPad called continuity markup where if you open up a document preview from Finder on your Mac by selecting it in Finder and then hitting Spacebar, you can select the markup button and then in the dropdown that appears, select the iPad Pro to mark up a document. So if you're working from a Mac, it makes it very easy to go in and sign contracts or mark up a document without having to move the document file back and forth between both devices. So that's everything that's made a positive impact on my use of the iPad Pro over the past six months. Now, before we talk downsides, let's talk battery life. The battery life on the iPad Pro in my experience is fine. Like it's not great. And that's because I always want it to last just a bit longer than it actually does. For what I use my iPad Pro for, I can get by charging it maybe once or twice a week, which is pretty good. Now, before iPad OS 15 came out, I noticed that the Find My app had a lot of background activity that seemed to be draining my iPad Pro's battery quite a bit. And the only thing that seemed to help was either turning it off completely or removing all of my air tags from my Find My network. Since iPad OS 15, this hasn't been affecting me as much and my iPad Pro's battery life seems to have improved. All right, next let's talk downsides and what's still missing from the iPad experience. One thing I use my iPad for a lot is to write on and Google Docs still doesn't have iPad cursor or trackpad support, which is low key infuriating at this point since these features have been out for well over a year now for iPads. Now you can get around this by using Google Docs on Safari, which as a browser on the iPad Pro will show websites in their desktop configuration, which is really useful. But the absence of trackpad and cursor support on major third party apps like Docs, or sometimes it can just be hit and miss like with Amazon's app, there's still some work for people to do in this area. Another downside to the iPad Pro experience is widgets. Apple still limits you a bit where you can place widgets, which is low key frustrating when you first start building your home screen compared to how you orchestrate a desktop on a Mac. Now, by far the biggest downside I found to using an iPad Pro are the limitations that you get with iPad OS. If you think about computing tasks with Apple devices, I think you can split them into two main categories, which are creation and consumption. Now to me, the iPad Pro, it checks all of the boxes for consumption. Think checking social media, email, reading articles, browsing the web, online shopping, watching a video, etc. Plus, it's a more flexible device for consumption than a MacBook Pro because you can use it in many more configurations. Where things get confusing though is for those who want to do what I'd consider to be more creative computing tasks. Think photo and video editing, coding, creating music, drawing and illustrations, etc. For the iPad Pro, there are technically apps that allow you to do all of these things, especially for drawing and sketching with the Apple Pencil. However, because iPad OS prohibits sideloading, which is downloading an application directly from the web, like you can safely do on Mac OS, you're more limited to what apps you can download on iPad OS, even though both the MacBook Pro and the iPad Pro now run off the same processor and cost roughly the same. So who is this iPad Pro for and do I recommend it? To me, the iPad Pro is a device that excels at consumption computing tasks and some creative ones. It can do some specific creative computing tasks very well, but it still can't replace a lot of professional apps and workflows you can do on a Mac due to iPad OS's limitations. I think you'd get this iPad because you want the pro hardware features that come with it. Like it's 120 Hertz mini LED display, LiDAR sensor, better rear cameras and M1 processor. And, or if you want an iPad in a larger form factor, because the iPad pro line is the only one with the 12.9 inch size. 
Now, if you don't need the top of the line features or you don't need a larger sized iPad, you should probably look at the smaller and cheaper iPad Air, which has the same form factor and accessories that you can get with an iPad Pro. And if you're interested in learning more about how the Pro compares to the Air, you should check out a video that I did on that exact subject, which you can get to by clicking the link here in this video, and then you can come back to this video or check out the link in the video description below. And lastly, if you're just looking for an iPad to mostly read on, maybe play some iPad OS games, I'd actually check out the iPad mini. It's about the same size as a Kindle and it's the lightest of all of the iPads that Apple makes, which to me makes it the best iPad to hold in one hand and read on for long periods of time. And we've done reviews on both the iPad mini and the iPad Air. So if you're interested in learning more about those two iPads, I've linked their reviews that we've done here in this video, as well as in the video description below. So ultimately, after spending six months with the 12.9 inch iPad Pro, do I recommend it? Yes. For me, I've loved using this iPad Pro because of its great screen and typing experience. In fact, it's actually replaced my old MacBook Pro as the portable computing device I carry around with me and write on. The iPad Pro starts at $799 US dollars for the 11 inch version and $1099 US dollars for the 12.9 inch version and comes in either space gray or silver. And you can use the purchase links on the side of this video or in the description below to learn more. I hope you found this video helpful. And if you did hit that thumbs up button and subscribe to the channel to see more six months later reviews like this one. For six months later, I'm Josh Tedder. Thanks for watching.